Um, that song right there actually goes right along with what I thought the Lord has laid on my heart, what He's given me. Give us clean hands and give us clean hearts. And I'm going to jump right into it very quickly. The title of my message tonight is, initially it was the bride and the altar, but I, I adjusted it today to, to say the bride of the altar. Mm. The bride of the altar. Father, we just thank you for your mercy and your grace, Lord. We thank you for your goodness. That though we be Gomer many times, Lord, you're Hosea and you come to get us every single time. Lord, we ask that you have mercy on us. That by your word, Father, through your spirit, that you make it real to our hearts and our lives. Help us, Lord, to hear what it is that you're saying in this hour. And we give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's been about three weeks ago that Matt had asked me if I wanted to preach on Wednesday on a Wednesday night. And I was like, yeah, man. You want me to preach on Tuesday and Thursday? And, and I only got about 150 messages to preach. Amen. But it was not until Monday night as I went into my room and I, I began to pray and I began to go and seek the Lord that I really found it difficult and I, I just I laid down in my bed and eventually I just began to talk to him about myself I began to talk to him about my heart and my weaknesses and all my frailties and all my sin and all those things that are inside of me and I just began to lay it out before him and say Lord do you know all these things about me and you knew them when you came and got me and Lord unless that you would uphold me unless that you would work in me unless that you would do something on the inside of me Lord there's no way that I could even live for you and I would guarantee you that the truth goes for every single person that sits in here tonight and every single person on the face of the earth that has ever really truly desired to serve the Lord they saw within themselves a difficulty a person on the inside that would not allow them to do that. Or maybe I'm alone. No, I don't think so, though, because the Word of God tells me the truth about the man is that his heart is deceitful and it's wicked. Not just me and not just few, a few of you, but every single man that's ever been born from the loins of his sinful father, Adam, Sin has followed after him. The word of God tells us that just a few days from the mother's womb and a baby is troubled. As we see sin in that baby and we see it as it begins to grow. They always talk about, and I hear the world say all the time, well, children aren't taught this, and they, they are, or children have to be taught hate, and children have to be taught this, and children have to be taught that. No, the truth of the matter is that on their insides, on the very inside of their person, is they're wicked and they're evil, just like you and I. That's the Word of God. That's what the Word says about us. And if you don't believe that, like the old preacher always said, that we'd like to listen to some of us, if you don't believe that, take the two little two-year-olds, put them in a playpen, and put the rubber ducky in the middle, and watch what happens. It becomes all about me. That's why we don't have to raise our kids up and, and, and teach them to do the wrong thing. We have to raise them up and teach them to do the right thing. We have to raise them up and influence them to go in the right direction. Yet we look all around us, and the world's a mess, and it's in chaos. Yes. But unfortunately, we like to blame the world for the condition of the world. And we also like to blame the world for the condition of the church. But I'm here to tell you that the problems in your heart is not the issue of the world. It's the issue of you. The problem in my heart is not the issue of the world, it's the issue of me. As a matter of fact, I will even go a step further and say that the condition of this great nation today is not so much because of this great nation, rather it's because of the condition that we find ourselves in as the bride of Christ. Come on. What's been going on? What we've seen happening in this church? What has been being uh, borne witness by the Spirit of God over and over and over again? The message that He keeps bringing is the bride. 
the bride, the bride. We saw it just a few weeks ago when Angie came and she brought the message about the ten virgins, right? The five foolish and the five wise. We've seen it through tongues and interpretation over and over and over again. Just a few weeks ago, the Lord blessed us with a, with a, a prophetic word about a bride that was hiding. I remember it very clearly. He said, where is my bride? Where is my bride? I've set my face towards you, but you've turned your face from me. And then Matt got up and preached a message about a bride that was running. Even to the point where he had a little veil that he carried around and that had stuck with me since that day. And I just thought, wow, how powerful. The Lord is really, truly saying something to us. He's saying something to his people in this day and age. And I believe this with all my heart that we are living in the time of the bride. We are living in the time of those ten virgins. The five foolish and the five wise. I'm here to tell you that we serve a good God. We serve a, a great Savior and He's mighty and He's powerful and He's coming back soon. This is no doubt the last days that we live in. And if you look around the world and you see what's going on in the Middle East and you see what's going on in Ukraine and you see what's going on in China and you see what's going on in the USA. And you tell me that things aren't shaping up just the way that this word says it is. I'm here to tell you, if, if you're not seeing it, then you're blind. If you're not seeing it, it's because you don't want to. And God help us if what I'm about to say makes you angry. But that's, I mean, I, I don't know what to tell you. But the best we have to offer up is Donald Trump and Joe Biden. God help us. Come on. If you think Donald Trump is fixing to save you from what's going on, I got news for you. You're sadly mistaken. Amen, preacher. Amen. Amen. That's a fact because he's not our savior. He's not the savior of the church. He's not the one that we should be looking to. He's not the one that we should be running around talking about and lifting up and talking about how he needs to get elected. No, we should be talking about the Lord Jesus yeah, Christ, yeah. who he is and what he did. We should be talking about the word of God that needs to go forward. But we went into a political arena. And they tell me, well, well you got to be aware of what's going on and you got to pay attention. And, and this is part of, uh, of everything that's going on and you need to pay attention to it. I, I pay attention to it from a distance. I'm well aware of what's going on, but it doesn't consume my life because I can care less who gets in the White House. All I'm worried about is what's happening in this house. Yeah, come on. That's right. Come on. What's happening in this house? <clears throat> and I'm here to tell you that there's a problem in the house today. Come on. There's a problem in the house today. I want to, and when we go to this little area of text, you might not think it's quite the message that I'm bringing, but we'll see as we go through it. I'd like to go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22 is where I'd like to start. And I'm sorry if I kicked the. Uh, I am here tonight already. You're good, brother. But it's okay. It's not an idol that hadn't been kicked. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22 is where we'll start. And I want to, before we get into the text, I want to make it clear. My goal is not so much to focus on the shadow that's being portrayed in this text. Because there's something much deeper than what's being portrayed. Now, don't get me wrong. The text in and of itself is deep. Because since I've gotten married, and it's only been in uh, February the 19th that, I, that I've gotten married, the Lord has been using this right here in my life over and over and over again to show me things about myself and then to show me things about Him. But I want to look at not the shadow that's here, but I want to look at the one who's casting it. 
the shadow. Do you know, do you understand what I'm saying about casting a shadow? The word of God talks about types and shadows in the Old Testament. We understand that all those things were types and shadows. Jesus told the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he said, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. But those are they that speak of me, yet you will not come to me that you can have eternal life. He said, all those scriptures, they were speaking of me. They were a shadow of what was to come. And what we see from the very beginning, even with Adam, because the word of God says about Adam, I believe Matt mentioned it uh, Sunday, that he was a figure of the one to come. The plan was always Jesus Christ. The plan was always Calvary. The plan was always the blood. Did you get that? Yes. So in the Old Testament, from Genesis chapter 1, we see a shadow being cast. As the Savior began marching in time that God created here on earth for humanity, he began marching towards his cross. And as he began marching, the closer he got to that day, the bigger the shadow got. As it was being cast forward about him. And we see in this Ephesians chapter 5, and this is what you got to understand, church. This is why marriage, the marriage between a man and a woman is so it, it, it's so holy and it's so sacred in the eyes of the church. You see, because the early church had an understanding of this mystery that was being talked about right here. Let's, let's get into it. Verse 22, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now that, that word submit is very important here. I want us to keep that word submit in our hearts and, and in our minds, an understanding of what that word means as we as we go through this. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, in the analogy that's playing out right here, I want you to understand what it is that we are as individuals. In this right here, in the marriage between a, a man and a woman, the man is typifying Christ, and the woman is typifying she's the bride. She's us, right? So in the marriage that takes place at the altar between yourself and Jesus Christ, Christ himself, he's the groom. He's the man. He's the head of the household. Amen? Amen. It's not the Pope. That's right. It's not Pastor Matt. That's right. It's not Brother John. It's not you or you or the church's preacher down the street or, or whoever it is. They're not the head of the church. Christ himself is the very head of the church. Amen. Christ himself is the very head of this vessel right here. He is supposed to be my head. Amen. He's supposed to be your head and your head and your head and every single individual in here tonight. If you've been born again and you've been washed in the blood and the spirit of God has entered into your heart. Amen. And he's given you a, a new heart yeah. and he's regenerated you. He's brought you back to a former state. And now you can walk in relationship with your father in heaven because you've been united as one with Jesus Christ. You're his bride. And he's looking to bring you into submission. Amen. Do you understand that? He's looking to bring you into submission. So that's what we see right here. We are the bride of Christ. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And, and, and I shared this the last time I preached, but what my marriage has really done for me is a lot of times when I go to act a certain way, towards my wife, I have to stop and really look at myself internally. And the Lord will convict me at times and remind me, Gomer, remember when you were playing the whore, Gomer? And I had to come out and find you and pull you out of the things of the world. Remember when it was you acting this way and that way and doing this and doing that? Do you really think that's the way? that you should be acting towards your wife? 
When you're supposed to be her head, when you're supposed to be her leader, when you're supposed to be protecting her and guiding her, when you're supposed to be the spiritual head of that household, and you're supposed to love her the same way that I loved you. That's how the Lord uses that in my life. And a lot of times I've seen men throughout the years, the first thing they want to do is look at some men. But they don't skip down and really look at that part and say, have I deserved to be submitted to? Have I been a man of God that has deserved to be submitted to? Well, I got good news for you, bride. I got good news for you, bride. Our heavenly groom, yeah. he, he's done what is needed. Yes. And he deserves submission. Yes. And I'm going to tell you right now from experience, that you'll be a lot better off if you'll find out how to submit. Hallelujah. He's a good groom. He's not just going to let you run off and not come looking for you. He's not just going to let you go and play the whore in the world. Can I say that word? I'm yeah. sorry. I know that's a, that's a tough word, but I'm using the Gomer thing here. And, that, and that's basically what it alludes to, that, that that's what Gomer was. She was a whorelet who Hosea was instructed by God to buy. For the very purpose of showing Israel. This is what you are. This is, is what you do. But every time. I'm so faithful. And I'm so good. I'm going to come and I'm going to get you. Yes. Amen. That's how good he is to us. Amen. But I also want to tell you. As good as he is. He's still God. Yes. And he's still holy. And he's still righteous. And he still forces no one to submit their life to him. He will not force anyone to submit unto his will or unto his way. Oh, he will go about trying to convince you that it's the best thing for you to do. And if he's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light and you find yourself in a backslidden state, I'm here to tell you that he'll chase you to the edges of hell. He'll chase you to the edges of hell to get what he's paid for because you're his. Yes. You've been bought with a price. Yes. And he will do everything he can to convince you that you need to come home. Yes. All the way up until the point to where it's going to be your decision that you're going to have to make. And in this time right here that we're living in, there is no doubt in my Mind, there is no doubt in my heart that we're living in a day where the Lord is dealing with his bride. And there's a wise bride and there's a foolish bride. There's a wise bride who is staying the course. Yes, we've gotten off track, some of us here and there, and gone astray, and we've all done it, whether we've sat in the church the whole time or we've been out in the world at part of the times. But there's a, a bride that he's convinced that there's only one way, it's his way, and he'll be your provision. And then there's a, a foolish bride that's set about looking for oil in her lamp. And she's set about looking for oil, for oil everywhere but the altar wherewith the oil was, was poured out, if you will. Every other thing is what she wants. She doesn't want the altar. Because the altar comes with a price. Yes. There's a price that accompanies the altar. Do you hear what I'm saying? Yes. We're living in a day and age where Christianity has become crossless. Come on. Amen. It has become crossless because we do not desire a cross. We desire a crucified Savior... But we do not desire the cross that he was crucified on. We don't want to talk about it. Because it's supposed to have an effect on us. And that's why I titled this message, The Bride of the Altar. Because I've determined within myself that I don't care what fad comes into the church. I don't care what signs and wonders follow it. It doesn't make a difference to me. I'm going to stand at Calvary. That's where I'm going to stand. For Calvary is the only place that I've found victory. It's the only place that I've found freedom. It's the only place 
that has caused me to be able to run and dance and leap with joy in my life is this place called Calvary where my Savior was united with me. Amen. It's painful sometimes. It's a painful place because there aren't people flocking around. It's lonely. It gets very lonely at Calvary. But the truth of the matter is, is that loneliness many times is a good place. For Jesus himself was alone before he went that night in Gethsemane. He, he found himself with blood flowing from his eyes as he sought the Father's will. He said, oh, Father, if there's any other way, then let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will, Lord, but yours. I'm here to tell you that this journey to get to where you want to go, it's not like what most preachers are going to tell you it is on television. It won't always be fun. It won't always feel great. You won't always be able to look at yourself and think, well, I'm all that and I'm awesome. Because I'm here to tell you you're not, and I'm not either. That's the fact of the matter. I know I'm not doing what most of them say that I'm supposed to do and encourage you in yourself and pump you up and tell you a bunch of lies about yourself. But the Word of God says that we are wicked and we are deceitful. And if we do not allow that heart to be crucified at that altar, we will find ourselves running after that heart. Running after what we think Running after what we feel, running after what we want. And I'm here to tell you, those things don't always really look bad. It's easy to point out the drug addict. It's easy to look and see the crackhead and the drunk. It's easy to look and see the promiscuous person. But sometimes it's hard to see the people that are full of heresies and false doctrines. Because the word of God says those are lust of the flesh as well. Heresies. False doctrines. A form of godliness. What does that mean? A form of godliness. It means it looks godly from the outside. It means you look upon it with your eyes and, and these people, they look godly and they appear godly. And for everything that you would think in your brain and in your mind, you're thinking that's a person who's godly and they must really love God. But the word of God says there's a form of godliness that denies. I said that denies the power thereof. I'm here to tell you, church, that the power of the bride lies at the altar. Amen. The power of the bride lies at the altar, and it lies at the altar alone. And you might go somewhere else, and you might find some kind of power that does something, but you won't find the power of the crucified Christ. Amen. For it is there that he paid for it, and it is there that you'll get it. There and only there. How did I get there from husbands love your wives? <laughs> husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Why did he give himself for it, church? It says he gave himself for that church. Husbands love your wives even also as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. I often ask questions so I can answer them. I, I get picked on about that sometimes. I didn't even know I did that a lot. But apparently I do. <laughs> the next verse tells us why he gave himself for it. It says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That the living word might sanctify it, set it apart. That's what that sanctification is. He sets it apart. Sanctifies it, sets it apart so that he may wash it by the water of the word. 
Our living word, our Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer, our husband. That loved us so much. He gave himself for us so that he can cleanse us and that he can wash us. He's a good Savior. Oh, he's such a good Savior. For you see, the only work that's really ever going to get done and accomplished that's going to be of God in the church is going to be by God. You can make up everything that you want to make up and you can put every scripture on it that you want to put on it. But unless it's birthed by God and carried out by God, it will mean nothing to God. Amen. For he alone is the one that can accomplish what needs to be accomplished. Yes, I am very clear that he uses humans to do that. Yes. I understand that. For some reason unknown to me, he chose to use us. And, and I'm even more astonished that he chose to use somebody like me. You know, it was just in December that you might find me sitting at a bar, shooting shots and getting drunk. It wasn't that very long ago. I thought about it today and I thought, wow, Lord, just the other day I was a mess, seeing how much I could damage my liver. Before my next birthday. Smoking and drinking and running and chasing and trying to fulfill my next lustful desire. After the Lord had gotten a hold of me in 2009, 2010 and done a mighty work in me. And I watched him doing things in my life that some people had sat in churches for 40 and 50 years and never experienced. Thinking that there was something good about me. A man full of sexual immorality and sin. Full of pride and, and selfishness. But yet there was something about me that I thought he needed. Realizing... That I needed him somewhat, but I, I, I really just thought he was waiting to do something with me. Boy, he's fixing to really touch the world with this guy. I was a mess, man. I was a mess. And how quick did it, did it take for me to leave my first love? How quickly did I move away? And, and I say quickly, I mean, I served him and walked in freedom for quite a few years victory and freedom and leading my family at the time, my, my now ex-wife. I'm telling you, the wilderness will cost you some things. Yeah. The wilderness will cost you some things. It'll mess some things up. Amen. Today, as I was on my way over here, I was coming from a million. I was driving in my truck and I began to think about my, my son. He's 14. Because I had thought about the time frame that I had served the Lord from about 2009, 2010, up until, I guess about 2017 or 6, 17, something like that. And then I, I thought about my son and I thought, I, I missed the most pivotal point of his life. From the time he was seven or eight years old up until right now when he's 14, fixing to be 15 years old, I missed it. And I didn't lead it in the ways that I should have led. And now, I don't know what to do about that. And I pray and I say, Lord, you, you got to take him. You got to keep him. He's your son now, Lord. I missed it. I messed up. I missed my opportunity, but he's yours. And I give him to you. The wilderness will hurt you if you won't submit He'll do what's necessary to bring you into submission because he loves you that much. And he allowed me to wander off into that wilderness of sin. And in that wilderness, I lost a lot of things. I lost a lot of time with my children. I lost a family that I had that the Lord had initially saved for me the first time. I lost it. 
gone. And I look back and I think, what might have been, Lord, if I had only believed you, if I had only really saw what was in me without having to go out in the wilderness. Because that's the work of the wilderness church. It's the same work of the altar. And you can find out at the altar. Or you can find out off in the, off in the wilderness. But you'll find out. If you're willing to see. The word of God says about the Hebrew children. That he led them. Out of Egypt. And he led them through the Red Sea. And he led them straight into the wilderness of sin. The book of Deuteronomy tells us he led them there to prove their hearts. He led them there to prove their hearts. And what I found out about the wilderness is the wilderness is going to do one or two things for the person that God is trying to deal with. It's going to cause them to be stripped of everything that they never thought they had to trust in and cause them holding on to nothing but the altar. Or it's going to cause them to make altars of their own. And that's the tale of two brides. People who wouldn't hold on to the promise of God. Who wouldn't see the truth about what was in themselves. They didn't like what the word of God says about who they are. We all want to hear the prophets with sweet words and kind lips and, and honey running off of their lips. And sometimes we, we act like Ahab and we want to be lied to. And we got to be careful because the word of God says with Ahab in the book of 2 Kings that he said, who will tell him the lie? Who will go and lie? And the lying spirit came before the Lord and said, I will. I'll go. And that lying spirit was sent to the prophets of Ahab and filled their mouth with a lie. And he believed them. And he called on Micah, Micaiah, however you say the name. Micah said, no, that ain't what the Lord is saying. That's not what the Lord is saying. And I'm here to tell you, there's a lot of people running around speaking to the people of God today. And all they're saying is, Good words and good things and everything's okay, bride. Everything is going to be all right. And, and you don't have to worry about nothing. But I'm here to tell you, that's not really what the Lord is saying to you. That's not truly what he's saying to his bride. What he's saying, bride, is we're in the end days. Yeah. We're in the last times and I'm about ready to make that call and I'm about to ready to look over to my right hand and I'm about ready to tell my son to go and get his bride Amen. and he's coming back for a bride who's spotless and without blemish a spot who's without a, a bride who's without wrinkle and without blemish come on one who has sat at the altar and allowed herself to be cleansed and to be washed and to be cleansed and to be washed and to be broken and to be crushed and to be poured out and to be built up and to be crushed and to be cleansed and to be washed. Just like a piece of clay. On a potter's will, no, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good at all. Not at all. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself. A glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle. Or any such thing. But that it should be holy. And without blemish. He's going to present it. To himself. That's what he's going to do. What I'm learning through reading the scripture. Is that it's God that works. In us. Philippians tells us. Philippians Chapter 2, verses 12 and 13 tells us this very thing. To work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And I've come to find out that my role in this is to learn how to submit. Mm -hmm. Learn how to submit. Learn how to submit to his will and his way. 
his will and his way. And I'm here to tell you that the same way that he had for Christ, you are not escaping. You are not going to escape it. If he would send heaven's best down here to pay a price for you and I, what makes you think that you're going to get out of this without going that way? Come on. Amen. I have people all the time that talk to me and they tell me, well, well, what about the Muslim? And what about this one? And, and what about that one? You know, they still believe in God and most of them try to do what's right and, and this and that. And, and how can you say that they're going, or that, that that's wrong? And my answer is simple. First and foremost, you have to put Jesus in one or two categories. Either he was a crazy lunatic or he was exactly who he said he was. That's right. There cannot be an in-between. Right. He cannot be a good man who done good things, but yet he was only a prophet. For he said himself that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father except but by me. So either he was right or he was deceived and he was crazy. He was the Savior, or he was nothing more than another David Koresh. Come on. That's all there is to it. There's no in-between. The next thing is, if he was who he said he is, and he came here and he lived a perfect life, and he shed his blood, he was beaten, and he was bruised, the Word of God, the book of Isaiah says that he was not recognizable as a man. I want you to, I want you to think about that. It says he was not recognizable as a man. I don't believe that just means his face. Because I could look at a human body if it just had some arms and legs and kind of tell that that was probably a man. And he was hung up there naked to where he was not recognizable as a man, the Word of God would tell us. So you're telling me that yes, Christianity is right and Jesus is right and all this, but everything else is okay. They don't have to believe in that. I'm here to tell you, either we're really wrong or we're right. There's no in-between church. And it's time we make a decision in the, uh, this last day on which bride it is that we're going to be. Amen. Which bride is it that you are tonight? Which bride is it when you walk out of here, what, a, what does your Christianity look like on Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday? And I'm not here to judge you and I don't, and that's not between me and you and, and my walk is, is not between you and me. For it is my job to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God that's working in me. And I guarantee you as individuals, if we'd spend more time looking at what's wrong with ourselves, we'd have a lot less time to see what's wrong with each other. Amen. And we'd be able to walk into a place more freely, loving one another. Amen. And not constantly seeing one another's faults and one another's failures. Because I have plenty of them. There's a lot wrong with me. But there's one thing that's right. There's a lot wrong, Robert. But today, there's one thing that's right. He showed up in December. Yeah. Out of nowhere. I wasn't even really looking. Thanks, God. I thought about him every now and then. I mm. thought about how I felt him. I thought about how surely he'd never use me again. I thought about, Lord, maybe I'll serve you one day again. But that's about it. I'll never be what it is that you intended me to be. I've messed too many things up. And all of a sudden, I began to feel something in my heart. A brokenness. And a little desire of being birthed. And in December, I laid the alcohol down. And I said, I don't want to deal with that anymore. And he set me free. And I haven't looked at it since. As a matter of fact, I was telling Matt, it was my tradition on Sundays while I was out in the wilderness, I would go through laundry at the laundromat 
And while my clothes was washing, I'd go to the daiquiri shop and I'd start laying it down. Even knowing how I would feel after just a few, that I would begin to feel tired and weak and just groggy. And, but still, I would do it over and over again. And now when I pass by the back of the shop, I just, my stomach turns. I think, oh Lord, I thank you for setting me free. I thank you for freedom and victory that comes to the altar. I thank you for that. And it was January the 3rd when I went to Tennessee with, with Ross Kibito and, and my brother Luke Poe that I smoked the last cigarette. Now I remember smoking it and, and saying, okay, I think this is gonna be it. When I got back from Tennessee, I left that pack of cigarettes sitting in my center console. I think I showed it to you one day, didn't I? I opened it up and Matt's first thought was, well, boy, still smoking. I said, no, nah, I'm just leaving it there. I'm just gonna let it sit there for a little while because they don't own me anymore. I own them. Amen. And I just threw it away one day. I said, okay. Point proven. There's victory Amen. in our Savior. Amen. There's victory in our Lord. And I'm here to tell you, church, that he'll give you victory. He wants to give you victory. He wants to give you freedom. He wants to do a work on the inside of you. He wants to sanctify you. He wants to wash you. He wants to cleanse you. The word of God tells us that. He desires to do that. Yes. He desires to wash you. He desires to cleanse you. He desires to take those things out of your life that do not belong there. Yes. Amen. But I'm here to tell you right now, he's not going to do it by any other way but Calvary. Come on. That's right. It's not going to happen any other way but the cross. Amen. That's the only way that it's going to go. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. And verse 32 says this, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. It's a great mystery to tell you. The Apostle Paul would tell the church in Ephesus that this right here that I just told you, it's a great mystery. But it speaks of Christ and his church. A couple of verses before he said, actually, he said, for we are members of his body, of his, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. I want to jump real quick, real quickly over to Genesis chapter 2, because I just want to tie something in real quick right here. Right here we see the mystery of Christ and his church, one flesh. Amen. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. And I don't know when I'll get to preach again, so y'all stuck with me until this is done. <laughs> Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. Exodus over here. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. 
And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helpmeet for him. And the Lord God could caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. In the very beginning of creation, in Genesis chapter 2, we see the very same thing that's echoed about Christ and his bride, that they will be one flesh. That they will be one. They will be united. We also see the fact that God took this woman that he created out of the flesh of Adam. And he brought it. Brought this woman to Adam. And ever since that day we've seen God through eternity. By his spirit searching the earth for a people. We see it with Abraham. Abraham was not seeking out God. He was in his father's house, a, a house of idol makers. And, and God spoke to Abraham and he said, come on out. And I'll make you the father of many nations or something to that effect. And then we'd see Isaac years later be born by the power of God after the body of Abraham and his wife were presumed basically dead and barren. And God said, okay, I'll bring this son forth now. And then we see the same thing with Jacob as God would deal with Jacob and he would come down and wrestle with him until Jacob would admit to himself and to God that he was a, a liar and a thief. And God would touch his hip and change his name. And so on and so forth and so on. And so forth. God is seeking out a bride for his son. He's seeking out a people that will believe him. He's seeking out a people that will submit to his will and to his way. Yes. And I, I believe from what I know about all of us in here that we've been born again. And we are the bride of Christ. We have the spirit of the living God living on the inside of us because for some reason he decided that he wanted us. Amen. He decided, Jessica, that he wanted you. Amen. He decided, Sister Pam, that he wanted you. Brother Benjamin, Amen. he wants you. Amen. He decided that he wanted you. Jeremy, he decided that he wanted me. When I was wanted you, when I was sitting out in that bar room, he decided, I'm not done with him. I want you. Hallelujah. Amen. And he knocked on the door of my heart and he drew me back in by his goodness. For you know, it is the goodness of God that leads a man unto repentance. And it's God's goodness that breaks me over and over and over again. You see, back then I thought I was something. And I thought I had something to offer. And I thought, surely God called me and gave me this great calling that he, that he gave me, this message and this understanding. Because I am something. And I have something to offer. But what I found out in the wilderness. That I wasn't ready then. And I'm still not ready now. And unless that is the hand of God. That readies me for even the smallest thing. There's nothing I have. To offer anyone. Amen. I had nothing. In and of myself to offer. My ex-wife. My children. My family, myself, back then, and even today, I have nothing of myself to offer. The difference between then and now is I know it. 
and I'm almost done. I want to go to Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 real quick. Y'all bear with me for just a few more minutes if you don't mind. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 34. And Jesus would say, Thank God that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. I'm here to tell you, church, that that way has not changed. Yes. Amen. And Christ is still calling to his bride, saying, Come, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he's still saying to his bride that there's a work for you here at Calvary, for I'm not done with you. There's things in you that need to go. There's things in me that need to go. I want to persuade you, don't be part of that foolish bride that's looking for oil in all the wrong places. For there is no oil to be found anywhere else. And I have just preached the message and one of the scriptures that she talked about is Jesus said that in the, the last days that they will come and they will say, I am Christ. And she had a little different take on that. And I'm not saying that what she said is wrong because I think she was right. But I think you can look at that a couple of ways. But they said what Jesus said, they will come in my name saying, I am Christ. Not saying that they are Christ, but saying that I am Christ. They'll say the name of Jesus. They say, yes, he's the one. Much like the Judaizers of Paul's day who would come in with, yes, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And this, Jesus, and that. And Paul would tell them, he said, they look to affect you. They want to affect you, but not in a good way. They want to affect you towards themselves. They want you for themselves. There's many ministries out there that they want you for themselves. They want you to need them. They want you to need what they have. They want you to need their anointing. They want you to need their calling. They want you to need their doctrine. They want you to need what they have to offer. And they tie it up and they pretty it up in the name of Jesus. But it ain't Calvary and it ain't the Jesus of Calvary. Amen. I don't care what else it comes with. And they're stealing the oil of the bride and they're stealing the oil of the church. Don't run after them. Amen. It's 2010, 2009. The Lord called me to preach. And I've shared this with Matt and I've shared this with other people. But I'll share it with you because I don't think I've shared it with all of you. But the word that he gave me that day was as I laid prostrate on the floor in the presence of God, broken. So let me tell you something. That's what the presence of God will do to you. It will break you. Amen. It will crush you. If you've never been broken in the presence of God, then I will venture to say that you probably never really truly been in the presence of God. Come on. Because when a holy, just, righteous God shows up, 
Amen. It will expose everything in you for what it is. Amen. And it will break you. That's right. It will crush you. But it will make you feel so clean. Hallelujah. It will make you feel so loved. I've never wept and cried so much, but yet felt so good and so loved. But the Lord showed up in my home that day, and I paced back and forth across the floor and I paced and I wept and I paced and I wept and finally I found myself on the floor just weeping and crying as the Lord was pouring into my spirit and he said this he said you tell my church to come back to my son for what he's done for what he's done is all that they've ever needed Amen. he said you tell them they're in or they're out that the door is about to shut and I could feel the heart of Christ and it was broken. And I felt more broken than I've ever felt in my life as I wept. And I could feel the heart of God as I felt his wrath and his anger building up. The word of God tells us that wrath is stored up against them daily. And it's storing up. And it's building up. And I'm here to tell you that Christ wants his bride. And he wants to do a work in her. But there's coming a time, church, and I'm not saying that it's next week. And I'm not saying it's next year. And I'm not saying it's 10 years now because I don't know when it is. But all I know is I know what God spoke to me. And he said the door is about to shut. They're in. Or they're out. And as I close this out, the Lord laid this on my heart on Monday night. And this is what's been going on in my heart ever since then. And he didn't change it. And he didn't direct me in another direction. I'm here to tell you that the message of the hour is don't leave the altar. There's a work there that needs to be done. There's a work there that needs to be done in you. There's a work there that needs to be done in me. And I don't care what comes flashing in your, in your eyes or in your ears. And I don't care what kind of signs and wonders follow up. Because the word of God says that in the last day they're going to come and they're going to have signs and wonders. And they're going to have all these things. I'm here to tell you they can come and raise the dead. And if it ain't Jesus Christ and him crucified, I don't want nothing to do with it. Come on. Because at the end of the day, that's what the front of this book to the back of this book is all about. And when it's all said and done, I'm going to stand on that. And I'll find out whether it was true or whether it wasn't. But I know one thing. Whenever I stand before him, I'm going to answer with this and say, this is what your word said, Lord. This is what I knew it to be. The victory that I've seen, I've seen it from what I've heard and hear and what you've done inside of me. Don't be deceived, church, in these last days. Don't run after this. And don't run after that. I'm not trying to call you to myself. And I'm not trying to call you to any ministry. I'm trying to call you to Jesus. For that's all that I've been called to do. Stand with me. Mm -hmm.